next speaker is Dr. Stella A. Stella is an assistant professor at the Department of Population Health at NIU School of Medicine. She is a chronic disease epidemiologist with a research focus on policies and community programs to improve lifestyle behaviors in immigrant communities. Stella is also a Hopkins alum, yay, having completed her PhD in epidemiology at the Green Book School of Public Health. In her presentation today, Stella will be discussing how research analyzing NHANES can help to address the growing diversity of the United States with a particular focus on the Asian American population. Stella? Okay, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, let me go ahead and share my slides. Okay, great. Uh, is the slideshow showing up? Not yet? Okay. Not yet. Great. Okay, good morning, everyone. I know a number of my colleagues and trainees and, and, and other people are, are on the call today, so hello, everyone. Um, so I'll just get started with um, a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to start with talking a little bit about uh, racial ethnic diversity in research. Um, we'll touch briefly on the model minority stereotype, and then we're going to discuss NHANES and Asian American representation, and then close with some summary thoughts. So many of you are familiar with the fact that the U.S. population is rapidly diversifying with regards to racial ethnic makeup. And there have been several reports published by the Brookings Institute in the past few years that have highlighted these demographic trends. In fact, this transition uh, to being majority minority, meaning majority non-white, has already occurred for 22 of the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. So this is a map that displays the most populous minority racial ethnic group in those 22 cities, with the number in parentheses illustrating the percent of the population that is white. So, for example, in New York City, where I'm located right now, um, the largest racial ethnic minority group is Hispanic, and 49% uh, of the population is white. And it's likely that the racial ethnic distributions of these metropolitan areas represent a microcosm of the future diversity of the United States. Sorry, I'm having a hard time advancing my slides. Okay. Now, some of the growth of the population has been driven by the growth of the Asian American and Hispanic populations over the past 50 years. In fact, the Asian American population grew faster than any other racial ethnic group in the United States between 2000 and 2010. And Asian Americans make up 5.6% of the U.S. population. So on an absolute level, it's still a small proportion of the overall U.S. population despite this growth. Now, I include this slide just to remind everyone who we are talking about when we are talking about Asian Americans. Um, there are a number of different diverse ethnic heritages that are included under that monolithic category of Asian Americans. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide here, you can see a list of 20 countries. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, but of course, if you uh, label yourself as having one of these countries of origin, you would be categorized as being Asian American uh, once you're in the United States. And I'd like to point out that this is not different, particularly for other racial ethnic groups. So for instance, if you're immigrating here from Guatemala or from Mexico, you'll be categorized as Hispanic in the United States, or similarly how um, blacks from the Caribbean are grouped together with blacks from Africa or black Americans. So there is a lot of advocacy being undertaken by many of our colleagues, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, pushing for data disaggregation within racial ethnic groupings, which is beyond the scope of this particular presentation, so I won't go into depth. But to some degree, much of what I'm saying throughout this presentation with regards to disaggregated subgroups really applies to all different racial, ethnic, and immigrant groups. So just to kind of close out on the quick stats about Asian Americans, um, 
there are about 17.3 million Asian Americans in the U.S. as of 2010. The largest groups are Chinese, Filipino, Indian, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. And I highlight these six groups because they make up approximately 86%, 87% of the Asian American population. Now, the shift in racial ethnic diversity is troubling for healthcare and health research because we also know that current health knowledge, treatments, and evidence-based practices have been developed primarily with white participants and patients. And despite calls to diversify research and recruitment, we are still lagging behind where we should ideally be. This brings us to NHANES and other large national health um, survey data sets. So Utica previously referred to the declining response rates over time, which is a larger concern for these types of studies. But I'd also like to spend a few minutes unpacking some of the key features of most national data collection efforts and the implications that it might have on the population captured and therefore diversity and representativeness. So first is the use of random digit dialing or RDD. Random digit dial recruitment relies primarily on calling those with landline telephone access, although there have been more recent designs and efforts to include sampling of wireless users. But um, RDD really fails to capture specific individuals. So for instance, those without any kind of telephone access, those who are medically underserved, or those who are unavailable at the times when surveys are conducted. So for example, working class individuals that have non-standard work hours. So RDD has really come under criticism for generating data that is representative primarily of older and white Americans. Another key feature of national surveys is that the geographical distributions of different subgroups racial ethnic subgroups are not fully accounted for. For example, uh, this map that I have here on this slide um, depicts a geographic distribution of Asian Americans across the United States. So the different colors represent the largest Asian group in that state. So for example, um, in California, the turquoise uh, means that Filipinos are the largest Asian subgroup in that state. Or in Texas, the largest, um, the largest Asian subgroup is Asian Indians. But this distribution is often not accounted for in study design, recruitment, or sampling. So the result is that the Asian American racial ethnic category across different data sets can actually represent very different Asian subgroups with differing social determinants of health and health outcomes and cultural norms, et cetera, which really makes it difficult to actually understand the current state of health disparities for the Asian American population. Lastly, another key feature of most national surveys is that they usually only collect data in English and Spanish. This is particularly problematic for the Asian American population because 33% of the Asian American population compared to 9% of the total US population have limited English proficiency and 75% um, of Asian Americans versus 22% of the US total speak a language other than English at home. So moreover, these linguistically isolated individuals tend to have lower income, less access to care, and worse health outcomes. So since these individuals are systematically not being included in large data collection efforts, our current understanding of health disparities are likely an underestimate of the health needs of Asian Americans. I mentioned before, I want to take a quick aside and mention um, the model minority stereotypes because understanding what it is and the consequences that it has on health research for Asian Americans is really critical. So just very briefly, to define the model minority stereotype, um, it's this idea that Asian Americans are believed to have high educational attainment, low crime rates, and a lack of juvenile delinquency, a lack of mental illness, close family ties, um, they're law-abiding, and have a hard work ethic. Now, some of the consequences of the model minority stereotype, in particular with regards to health research, is that Asian Americans are not considered a community of color or a disparity group. 
And in fact, Asian Americans are the most understudied racial ethnic minority group in the United States. An analysis showed that 0.01% of Medline articles included any Asian Americans in the study sample from 1966 to 2000, and 0.17% of the total NIH budget funded research studies that focused on Asian American or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations from 1992 to 2018. And you would at least anticipate that these percentages would be somewhat close to the overall U.S. population of Asian Americans, which is 5.6%. So there is a clear um, disparate amount of funding being allocated towards these populations. And this prolonged disparate funding will lead to uh, worsening disparities over time. So I wanted to just show a couple of examples of how this actually looks in the real world. Uh, the first is a, a, a paper that was published in JAMA looking at prevalence and incidence trends for diabetes. Um, this is a few years ago now. But when you look at the graph stratified by race ethnicity, um, you can see that there are Blacks, Hispanics, and whites on the graph, but Asians are missing. And this is something that you will often see in the literature when you're kind of trying to dig deeper and figure out exactly what you know Megan was talking about, like setting up your research question, what data actually exists, what analyses already exist, um, you'll see this absence of, of data on Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. Here's another example from the American Journal of Public Health. This is looking at the effect of Obamacare on racial ethnic disparities and health insurance coverage. Uh, I know this graph is a little bit small, but um, it is also stratified by racial ethnic group and uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders are also on not, not on included in this analysis. And this was using census data. So this would be presumably on any, everyone. Um, this is a line in their methods section. We focused on whites, blacks, and Hispanics in line with much of the literature on health disparities. So, you know, it's just perpetuating the, the idea that uh, Asian Americans are, are, are not a health disparity population. So turning now to NHANES and Asian American representation in NHANES, um, you know, NHANES really recognized the important gaps um, in representation in health data and surveillance. And so um, NHANES started oversampling Asian American and Pacific Islander populations, which you took a, um, referred to starting with the 2011-12 survey wave. Um, just to go into a little bit more detail about the oversample, um, in 2011-12, the sample size for APIs was increased to approximately 750. In prior years, it was approximately 100. And uh, they have been included as an oversample on every subsequent wave, starting from 2011-12. And there are some health outcome measures for APIs that can be conducted using one two-year data set, um, but many of them require uh, multiple combined waves to get point prevalence estimates, for example. Um, Asian Pacific Islander is now available as a race ethnicity category. Um, however, disaggregated data are not publicly available. That's something that uh, you would need to access through that limited access data set uh, process that, that you took, uh, referred to. So, however, while we are seeing many publications that now include the Asian American Pacific Islander data, um, so this is an example. I, I didn't, I, I purposely did not put author lists on this. Um, we, you know, we are all, we are also observing the fact that newer analyses that have this new data in it are, are actually still not including um, Asian Americans uh, routinely. So, you know, part of these patterns are somewhat attributable to the fact that these analyses are, are trend analyses that have baseline values from 15 to 20 years ago. Um, but this also points to a larger limitation of the data, the NHANES data, that despite having been added, it will be several years or even several survey waves before meaningful trends can be presented for Asian Americans using NHANES, let alone any kind of longitudinal, longitudinal analyses with um, linked, linked data sets. So we have also undertaken a comparison to assess the difference between NHANES and other national data collection efforts and um, our locally collected large-scale data collection efforts that we perform in partnership with community-based organizations that serve the Asian American population. 
Uh, we refer to this as our, our CHRNA or Community Health Resources Needs Assessment. So using data from the 2013-15 CHRNA, we found that our community partner and collected data captured more Asian Americans that were uh, lower income, uh, lower education. They were more likely to be on public insurance or uninsured and to report uh, fair or poor health compared to the NHANE sample. So this points to the importance of complementing national data, uh, which may underrepresent the linguistically isolated and Asian Americans with lower socioeconomic levels with um, community sourced data. So I wanted to offer a few suggestions for best practices for analyzing NHANES for uh, NHANES data for minority groups. Um, as I mentioned before, some of these lessons learned don't apply only to Asian Americans, but also apply to other racial, ethnic, minority, and immigrant groups as well. Um, so number one, suggest presenting all available data in its most granular form. This is a recent analysis using NHANES where we assess disparities in sources of added sugar and high glycemic index foods across racial ethnic groups. And as you can see, we presented data on all racial ethnic groups and in the most granular form available. This is particularly important at a national level for the Hispanic population, where those coming from countries other than Mexico, for example, those coming from El Salvador or Cuba, which have been uh, large sending large sources of, of Hispanic immigrants in recent years, are also contributing meaningfully to the growth of the Hispanic category. Okay, uh, number two, it's really important to contextualize the data um, using language, basic language in methods in the discussion. So for example, in this added sugar analysis, um, this was included in the methods, data for Hispanic and Asian American subgroups were unavailable due to limited sample sizes. So you'll often see, you know, data are not presented on Asian Americans or data are not presented on other Hispanics because of limited sample sizes, but here we actually present those data, but we just kind of qualify the fact that we didn't look at um, subgroups. Also, in the discussion and in the limitations, we added a few sentences in the discussion. We said, in addition to important differences in demographics within Asian Americans by subgroup and country of origin, there is also large variability in cardiometabolic risk. So just kind of contextualizing the findings that we don't have subgroup data, but you know, it's something that should be considered when interpreting these results. And then in the limitations section, we believe our findings are largely generalizable to U.S. children. However, prior studies have determined that Asian Americans included in NHANES uh, are skewed to higher income and better educated individuals. As such, the results may not represent low income and less educated Asian Americans. So a couple other best practices. Number three, um, dig deeper. So understand who has actually been included in the analyzed NHANES wave for, with regards to socioeconomic status and subgroup. Um, so just looking quickly from the NHANES site, they have this um, sentence to facilitate oversampling of Asian Americans, which began in 2011. Selected survey materials were translated into Mandarin Chinese both traditional and simplified, Korean and Vietnamese. So what this tells us is that NHANES may adequately capture and represent um, Chinese and Korean Vietnamese speakers um, and potentially English speaking across all groups, including uh, Filipinos and South Asians, which tend to have a higher level of, of, of English proficiency than those other groups. But it may also be less representative of some South Asian subgroups that do have limited English proficiency or Pacific Islanders, for example. You may or may not want to actually include this kind of detail in your manuscript, but the contextualization is important to, to kind of more meaningfully make comparisons with published literature, other published literature, which you often are doing within the discussion section. So if you're trying to figure out why a result is kind of strange or off, it may be because you're comparing apples to oranges within uh, your different subgroup populations. And then number four, if possible, present in tandem with locally collected community data. So 
um, we have sort of taken this approach where we'll, we'll use national or other administrative data sets, um, but then we'll also kind of make comments about the, the local, the, 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 um, the community-based data that we have. I'll just add a caveat to that, however, that this strategy has been met with mixed, mixed success. Uh, some peer reviewers don't really like this and they don't really understand why we're doing this. So if it's not possible to do that within your manuscript, you can always publish that separately and then you can refer to it uh, within, your, within your analysis. So just to kind of summarize, um, as we see now through these three presentations, NHANES analyses are an important starting point to planning, resource allocation, and policy making. And to illustrate, to illustrate this, I put together this um, non-exhaustive and sort of crude representation of a cascade of events that, that really starts with a primary data source like NHANES. So for example, you may do an analysis, which could lead to a publication, um, the analyses across some kind of topic area are compiled, um, maybe in the form of a systematic review. This could lead to further study, maybe in the form of funded grants. Um, the compiled knowledge can actually also directly lead to evidence-based policy and practice, um, or it may also be, you know, fed into complex, complex models such as AI or other micro-simulation models. And so the idea is that if racial ethnic minority groups, including Asian Americans, are not included at this outset, then it essentially stymies the representativeness of the entire pipeline of future research and practice. And it's the systematic lack of data that will perpetuate the continued mismatch between the health research literature and the growing diversity of the US and ultimately the health of the nation. So uh, I'll finish with my acknowledgement slides and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Um, so we have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one relates to uh, data sets of um, other underrepresented groups. So are there any other national data sets that have indigenous representation? Uh, this uh, questioner is finding that, that they've largely been left out of these kinds of national surveys. Um, I'm guessing by indigenous, the person means like Native American and Alaska Native type of populations. That I don't know the answer to, unfortunately. Um, I think that a lot, so like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the um, there are a lot of limitations with, with the national data sets. I think that there has been a lot of progress in terms of those indigenous populations with sort of like one-off cohort studies that have been developed sometimes in, mostly in partnership with those indigenous communities. Um, and so it's kind of similar in that sense with, with a lot of the themes that I was talking about with the Asian American experience that we found that it's really you know, the community-based local data collection that is informing a lot of the grant efforts or informing a lot of the publications. And again, you'll sort of find this absence of, you'll probably find most of those indigenous populations like grouped in the other category in a lot of the national analyses that you do see. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a good answer for like a catalog of indigenous population research because that's not my area. But, but again, I think some of the, the, the themes really do um, cut across. Uh, for Asian Americans and for other smaller um, underrepresented groups. So another, thank you. So another question relates to sample size. So uh, the question is, what is a good minimum sample size for a minority subgroup for inclusion in analysis? Um, and what number might be too low, say if, you, if you're wanting to have a, a Asian American subgroup? So I see, I, I don't know if Josh or Yutaka have a better answer for this. We um, undertake a number of different um, strategies at, 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 in, in our section. Um, we always try to like look at the data that's available and um, that's the first kind of strategy that we do. Um, we also have adopted a strategy that is used by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which involves flagging estimates that are potentially unstable, so maybe those that have a large relative standard error, 
um, we will often sort of flag those estimates. And then if we find that if we're doing an analysis and, you know, a lot of our estimates are really being flagged and they're, they're you know, we don't feel comfortable with sharing the results because it just doesn't seem very reliable, um, you can also combine survey waves. You can combine um, across survey waves. And, of course, that's, that's limited, right? Like if you're looking at, if you want to look at the prevalence of some, um, some phenomenon and you have to combine six years of survey data to get the sample size you want, then there, there's a limitation to that too. So I don't think that I wouldn't put a, unless Josh or Yutika or Megan have like another idea, I, I don't typically put a number on a minimum sample size. I usually, it's usually like a sort of like a more comprehensive exercise that you have to go through to, to you know, feel like whether or not it's a reliable estimate or not. I completely agree with what Stella has said and endorse what she said 100 percent. If I could endorse it more, I would. Uh, and it also depends <laughs> on what's the scientific question. Are you trying to get a prevalence estimate or are you trying to get, let's say, a logistic regression coefficient? Um, and in that case, it depends also what, what is your outcome. If your outcome is a low prevalence outcome, you're going to have uh, higher standard errors there just on the virtue of you're looking at something that's low prevalence to begin with. So if you've got a low prevalence outcome to begin with and you're looking in subgroups, you're, you're, you, that, that compounds the problem. So um, it, it depends a lot on what you're trying to, to learn and what the, the scientific question is as well. Yeah, so Thanks, I, something I can add is that, uh, so, uh, yeah, Stella mentioned, you know, uh, we, we, these things, uh, we, we can talk about the how, you know, what uh, reliability of estimates uh, as opposed to what sample size we need. And uh, for the uh, NCHS, National Center for Health Statistics, have some standards for uh, these sort of thing. And for prevalence, um, there has, there has it, it's been a couple of years, maybe two years ago, we put uh, pub, uh, a new guideline for reliability, how to assess, how to, how to assess the reliability of uh, prevalence have been published. I'm not going to detail about that, but you can look at that. And also there is, uh, for, that was for prevalence and the other estimate, which usually takes as a form of mean, for means, uh, traditionally, uh, sort of cutoff is we like to have the relative standard error, meaning uh, standard error divided by the point estimate of the estimate, point estimates should be maybe, uh, should be 30% or less. That sort of that, then we don't worry too much about it, but uh, uh, it's not a very strict, you know, uh, we, we published some of the un, quote and quote unreliable estimate with RSC of 30% or 40% or more. But we flag it, you know, tell the users, read that these are not uh, reliable. Uh, so that's one way to go. And there are some very sophisticated mathematical uh, manipulation. These RSC or other one, the other one, prevalence guidelines they would be somehow translated, could be translated to the minimum sample size. And sometimes there's statistic called um, DEF, design effect. Those could be used to do those sort of translation, but it, it's too, it's a loaded question. So I'm refraining from going into the detail, but if you can learn about it. But one attitude is, uh, you know, uh, you already have the data, try to estimate and then decide if it's, you, once you estimate it in a correct way, you can get the idea of how reliable it is and you can make a decision. Oh, this is too, too unreliable. We're not gonna publish it. Or we maybe publish it because as Stella, you know, Stella mentioned the uh, meta-analysis, you know, if, if there's different, you know, if there's a collection of estimate, we, each one may be unreliable, but when taken a look at, used as, as a whole, as a, as a set of estimates, they, they may be pooled and combined to produce more reliable estimates. So anyways, I guess I stopped, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think I would just advise, like, thank you, thank you, Yutaka, for adding that. I, I think I'll just also advise, like, what we often see in the literature is that the Asian American 
sample is just not even presented, right? So like at the minimum, just look at it, include it, look at it. If it's, if it's not great, like we find ourselves in our group, like sometimes we, we can't include it either, right? And it has to be that sample size thing. But the problem is that if there's this sort of perpetual sample size, sample size, sample size, and it's like never reported, then there's no use in NHANE spending all this money to do this oversample if nobody's gonna publish on the data. So I think that's, that's part of it too, right? Like just look at the data that's there and then it becomes an exercise of deciding as to whether or not you actually wanna present on it. Thank you so much. I think we need to take at least five minute break. Thank you, Stella, again. You should really come back to us because I know your talk is over an hour seminar and the same thing to you talk, I will like to invite you uh, later. Um, I think we're going to take a five minute break, right? Uh, or a six minute break. So please come back um, 1045 um, and don't be late because we're going to vote for our next symposium topic. We're going to choose the data. So let's take a break. So sorry, Stella, again for cutting the great conversation. Don't worry. It would have been very really nice if we are on site as we originally talked about. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would have been great because I'm looking at the chat box and the comments and. Um, yes, I'm great. looking up, um, Jan, I'm looking up the project for you right now. It's being led by the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum. Um, but it's really for data disaggregation. That is an effort that started in 2015, and it was a collaborative mm -hmm. effort between PolicyLink and um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And it's about data disaggregation across all racial ethnic groups. And in fact, you may be familiar with the fact that in 2017 or so, they um, made new proposals to change the way that the census data collects racial ethnic subgroup information and unfortunately, um, the OMB turned them down. So at the federal level, and so you, could, so if you were to take the census now, or if you've already taken the census, you would have seen that the the collection of subgroup data is not really um, represented well in in the the census 2020. But um, the health forum has continued the work and is looking towards data disaggregation efforts. I want to say right now they're focusing on four states. I think it's California, New York, Michigan, and Nevada in terms of working with the, the state government to improve the collection of disaggregated data for different racial, within racial ethnic subgroups. But this is the more information on the project. Okay. Well, I'm excited to have this conversation. All right, let's move on. Kevin, um, do we have the winner for next year's symposium? And his is the winner. You know, it's a library and I found it surprising because it, I will say number one question I get it has been um, H cup. Uh, um, but and, and his is definitely the winner. I can argue with the data. <laughs> All right, so 